Okay, sir. Do I have yes, your permission? Sir. Yes, yes. I yes. Uh, will go go ahead. Uh, okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I heartily welcome all of you in the Langlish online lecture series, day 14. At the outset, we, the team of Langlish, need to thank all the participants who have, who have joined with us by logging Zoom app regularly, and those who are watching, enjoying, and learning with us live on Facebook and YouTube channel, Langlish Educators. Thank you very much for your love, words of appreciation, blessings, and academic support. We have been receiving overwhelming response from all over India and abroad. Nationally and internationally acclaimed academicians are going to deliver their talks on various aspects of language and literature on the forthcoming days. In addition to that, it's not the end of lecture series. It's uh, just a new beginning. We will arrange such lecture series every now and then. We will try our best to invite well-known academicians during this lockdown period. We are uh, giving unique, there are certain instructions for the participants. We are giving unique certificate to each and every participant, but the participants need to fill the Google form and send their Zoom participation screenshot or YouTube channel language educators subscription screenshot where you have watched all these videos to the email ID elanglitmotivators at the rate gmail.com. Our designer is working on the certificate very soon you will receive the Google form link. We are not generating certificates by Google forms. We are working on the certificates manually. That's why it takes time. You need to approach me through mail uh, after, after 10th of May. You can also visit the journal's website, www.langley.org. Kindly keep in touch. Don't forget the, to subscribe the channel so that you will get further notifications for new uh, speakers. So let's share and grow together. Friends, today uh, we have with us a well-known academician, Dr. Viva Booth, ma'am. Uh, she has a teaching experience of 16 years at the J. Narayan Vyas University, Jodhpur. Her areas of interest include African-American women, diaspora, partition literature, and Indian feminism. She has part participated as well as presented papers in more than 30 national and international conferences. She has written a book on communication skills, namely communication techniques. She has got published many research papers published in national and international uh, journals. At present, she is mentoring five PhD scholars. So without further delay, may I invite Dr. Viva Booth, ma'am, to deliver her talk on examining examining uh, critical perspectives on art, art, uh, archetypal theory and correlating archetypal criticism with the selected critical theories over to you ma'am uh, thank you prashant sir that was that was too much of an appreciation for me thank you so much and uh, uh, welcome to all the participants and here I start up with my presentation. Uh, so the title is already there on the screen. And uh, let me at the outset uh, tell you about the structure of my presentation. At the outset, I would define what is myth or archetypal criticism. And uh, uh, I would elaborate my explanation with the point of view of different critics who have done their extensive research on archetypal theory and in the second part of my presentation, I would relate the archetypal criticism with the selected critical theories. Uh, I could come across some relationships with the different isms and archetypal criticism, of course. So uh, in the second part of my presentation, I would definitely elaborate talk on that. So uh, here I begin with the presentation. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to introduce myth criticism. Now, myth criticism endorses the autonomy of literature and its study. It does not consign the critic to vacuum seal his brain. And uh, it gives the brain more ideas and more approach towards thinking. Uh, since uh, the inherent faculty of man is to think and connect things and build up stories, listen to stories, that is why 
generally speaking about myth criticism instead of uh, just linking it to the psychology aspect it links the the people towards anthropology as well and uh, it may broaden up the horizons the thinking horizons of people and the the mode in which an individual experiences a myth so uh, it has more to do with just being a story it has more to do with just being an approach towards a story it widens up the thinking horizons altogether someone said that intelligent theory holds out the possibility of unintelligent practices well here too it goes uh, this uh, whole this holds true for this approach as well now if uh, when inverted persephones emerge out of thin layer of air or grail quest replaced the original plot this possibility seems to have been realized so uh, in my first slide i would like to begin up with the general general principles of the creation of a myth a uh, mythopoeic faculty uh, mytho uh, mythopoeia means the creation of a myth so mythopoeic faculty is inherent to thinking and answering a basic human need of telling and listening to the stories so uh, the the basic instinct right from childhood that we have is of listening to the stories the the craving the hunger the thirst for the stories and the story element so it caters to that it it supplies enough fuel to that faculty uh, the second point is the myth forms a matrix out of which literature emerges myth gives a fertile ground to literature and literature emerges out of that so the literature emerges psychologically as well as historically out of a myth compilation of images figures plots characters themes so many ideas take place through when we start listening the myths and about the myths and about the stories and the third point here on my slide is myth stimulates it encourages thinking it it provides the material to the further thought so myths not only stimulates provides concepts and patterns from which the critic can use the specific work for his own purpose the critics choose out things and the story is formed or maybe the critical analysis takes place for the run for more research work the fourth point over here is literature moves us due to its mythic quality so literature is a whole and myth is a part so it moves due to the part so parts join together to form a whole so the ancient and the ba basic myths contribute to the mythic quality of the literature and allusions make it more interesting now the second slide is the characteristics of the archetypal or myth criticism this is a kind of introduction again towards what myth criticism is now the cultural relationship of myth and the culture the, the sorry the relationship of myth and culture is very complex it's entwined it's very uh, you can say um difficult to know about the connections and the knots and where in they lie so um in this particular um, part of my slide i'd like to um explain two two or three i would like to take up two or three examples uh, as in keatsian odes to nightingale where um philomela is referring to greek and roman mythology will philomela was raped by terius her brother in law he cut her tongue so that she's not able to talk about it to anybody so god made her a nightingale further on and she is able she is able to avenge her rape so this story stands as a backdrop for the kitsian old or to nightingale so uh, the another image that that i have picked up from uh, kitsian old the the blushful hippocrene so i'd like to quote the lines from the poem o to grecian urn i quote full of the true the blushful hippocrene so hippocrene is the name of the spring that was created by stamping of pegasus's horse uh, drinking led to the poetic inspiration uh, from that spring and uh, the blushful is used to personify the drink because of its red color so the blushful hippocrene image stands at the as a backdrop of this poem again and uh, as the name suggests again uh, the kitsian ode ode to grecian urn it's from the the urn uh, is from the grecian mythology grecian greek culture 
And uh, I'd like to quote some lines again from the poem, which are very close to my heart, but of the, uh, of the context. I quote, heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter, unquote. Well, moving on towards the explanation, uh, towards the slide again. Uh, gnomes introduced, they, they appeared in uh, Chronicles of Narnia. And th there were so many examples, but since there is a paucity of time, we will not be able to discuss everything over here. But then there's a gist of the examples as well. Now, the next point is fundamental symbolic form representing to our own world. Now, the myth gives you a, a basic idea about a form, about a character, about a story, and that that idea or the character that reflects from our own world. Now, Pygmalion is a myth from Metamorphosis by a Roman poet Ovid. In this drama of ideas, denial and obsession were the main features of Pygmalion, the sculptor, and his creation, Galatea. So the myth belongs to the Greek mythology as well, Roman and Greek. The problem played by G.B. Shaw um, states that uh, the sorry, Professor Higgins doesn't marry Eliza in the end. So the myths are busted also. But the basic idea of creation of a, a, a person, a, a, a city girl to a lady, the concept, the basic form has been imported from a myth that is Pygmalion by Ovid or from the Greek mythology. So the myth is though uh, not followed over here entirely, but the idea of form, a structure has been definitely borrowed from a myth. So I, I again quote a couple of lines from uh, G.B. Shaw's Pygmalion. I quote, uh, though uh, they go on, they take the entire presentation to the lighter side of it, but again, no relevance with the absolute uh, idea of the thing, but still I love these lines, so I'd like to quote them. Uh, I quote, women wants to live her own life and man wants to live his. Each tries to drag the other to the wrong track. One wants to go to the south, the other to the north. As a result, both have to go to the east. They both hate the east wind eventually. So let's get back, I unquote, and uh, let's get back to the main, um, the third point of the slide. Myths are non-intellectual non-discursive and typically imagistic. Now imagination has a role to play. Lots of imagination is involved. In Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, Juliet says, I quote, gallop apace your fiery footed steeds towards Phoebus's lodging, unquote. Here she wants to say that Phoebus is uh, uh, the god of sun and uh, Julius, uh, Juliet is calling the god of sun and saying that that send him home quickly, send the send the sun home quickly, so that I may see my beloved, I may see my lover once again. And in uh, the Paradise Lost by Milton, the Genesis story about is about the fall of the man. So it has again been borrowed. Uh, the the wasteland by T. S. Eliot again is one of the examples wherein the myth of the grail quest and the fisher king uh, they originated from the gaelic tradition and they were borrowed and they come to the christian civilization but they were originally from the gaelic tradition and uh, eliot has not taken these myths from the bible so there are there are sources for the myths into literature romeo and juliet and paradise lost the wasteland all the myths have been borrowed from different sources. So um, I, I, I'd like to take on my, I'd like to take on with my another slide. And let us see over here that what the different critics have to say about mythology. Uh, Levi Strauss in his structural study of the myth uh, published in 1955 um, explains the myth in the form that that uh, he breaks in the he breaks the myth into motives and he creates different parts out of that myth the first point is myth is a language and should be given a logical it should give a logical model to the society now he has picked oedipus myth uh, for his convenience and he breaks the myth into myth into different parts different segments and creates a structure out of them and then he correlates those structures and he moves further on with his his uh, research so uh, a couple of structures which I have uh, noted down on my slide. 
are like overrating of blood relationship where an edipus marries his mother zocasta underrating of blood relations when edipus kills his father lies difficulty in maintaining body posture and there were defect there were de uh, different defects in the people the physical defects were made the characterial defects so uh, levi strauss uh, breaks the myth into motives he comp compares the myth to another to one uh, from one another uh, he compares to find the patterns in relationships so now uh, when the person is lame or is left sided he behaves in a particular way and he related those things and he finds the patterns in the behavior of the particular character now uh, moving on to the second point myths must be approached in its structural form so the structural approach and the mental processes dedicated towards analyzing the myth are similar to those in science as in he did uh, he he behaved earlier in in his research that he put the the myth into segments into parts and he analyzed every segments to his own convenience and then he uh, came to a conclusion so it's a kind of a research wherein he goes about the repetition inversion projection and mediation so he suggests that the foundation of structuralism is based on the innate understanding of the scientific process which seeks to break down complex phenomena into its component parts and then analyze the relationships between them the structuralist approach to the myth is precisely the same method and as a method it can be applied to literature as well so he is applying that structural form ultimately to the literature to the study of the characters as he did in the oedipus myth so and uh, roman linguist jacobson calls it a phoneme because it's again a structural study and it goes into the language system the third point is myths have aim so in his book uh levi uh, strauss says myth and the myth and meaning uh it was published in 1979 and he said that myths work on bundle of relations so now uh, again uh, i think i have a story to narrate to you which is quite related to the context that once levi strauss went to a restaurant it was an overcrowded restaurant and uh, therein uh, to fetch a chair for himself he had to talk to uh, the lady who was a waitress over there so he introduced himself and the sudden response from the lady was that anthropologist or a jeans well me wise no we have a jeans a brand of jeans so the conclusion that he came that he came to from that particular experience is thus he came to an inference that even myth is a type of language which predisposes us to attempt to understand ourselves and our world by superimposing dialects dichot dichotomies and dualistic grids upon data that may in fact be entirely integrated so the relationships the the structures are actually entwined are actually mixed into one another so coming back to the point where in he says myths have aims uh he says that myths work on bundle of relations i have a story to narrate to you over here as well it's it's a, it's a reference to a myth that maybe it's a myth attached to a real incident so we can call it a legendary myth rather om banna was a person who who was driving through a highway and suddenly he met with an accident banna is uh, we we use the word to address the elder brother so um the way it is it is the way we address our elder brothers is we we attach the word banna after the name so om banna is the person who was traveling through a highway and he met with an accident near a particular tree so um, till they date the people say that they have seen the motorbike moving around that particular tree but without a driver so they have created temples and a huge uh, mela sort of thing has been developed over there and why i am narrating this story to you at this point the levi strauss said myths have aims so this myth has an has a very particular aim that this particular zone is accident prone area so you must either slow down or you must either stop make a stop over for uh, visiting the temple or whatever you should be slowing down is the ultimate aim of the myth however the myth has been created whatever be the uh, truth about the bike moving around the tree or not but 
the ultimate aim of this myth is towards the slowing down the speed of the people at that particular zone because that particular zone is on highway and that is a, an accident prone area so myths have aims and they are used to explain to people that that what should be done and what should not be done okay so i i move on myth is too complex to master so um, mastering a myth or you can say sorting out the situation is really very difficult it's it's very you can say a complex a system now he breaks the myth into a uh, levi strauss make breaks the myth into smallest components and those are called my themes dies chronically and synchronically he has put the the, the data apart and then he entwines them and puts them in the form of the the structure it was presented to him so ultimately the conclusion from this is that he made myth break up and then reconstructed it them at the same time for his convenience of the research now uh, the example that i have put on my slide is the menstruating woman is considered um to be impure in uh, in some religions um they say that a menstruating woman if touches a cow the cow becomes infertile now how, it's very complex uh, myth to master you cannot master this particular idea and women's status in the society of course is a very complex thing to master so myth is too complex to master and um now i move on to the next critic Carl Jung has a lot to say about the archetypal criticism because he used archetypal criticism to delve into the psyche of man and explain the different aspects of human consciousness now as in the first point the word collective unconscious comes over the collective unconscious mind within the concept of psyche does the accumulating work now what is collective unconscious now collective collective unconscious is a storehouse of images symbols and uh, stories and you are you are quite unaware of that stock that is going within you unconsciously you are creating a collection that is collective unconsciousness some stories some images some figures some uh, you can say uh, everyday happening some things that go and settle in your unconscious mind those are collective unconscious now in the next point uh, there is a term personal unconscious personal unconscious is a prudent concept which means some material that has affected a person for a time being but now it is disappeared from the consciousness memories that have been suppressed for some reason or the other now they do not directly affect the pers personality of that particular person but from freud's concept it is that the, the these particular things have just gone they are they are not to be remembered forever but for jungian concept collective unconscious is particular thing that is a storehouse and it can be brought back and it can be revised for anything else for anything that's going on in that person's mind or maybe some incident that makes a person remind of some happening in the past which is quite related to the current incident that's happening so that is the collective unconscious concept by carl jung now the collective unconscious does the work of accumulating as the definition says that it is the work of collective unconscious to collect up the ideas the data the the symbols the, the great mother the cow so uh, it does the work of collecting dreams fantasies and other exceptional state of mind the most far fetched motifs symbols as a result of particular influences traditions excitations working on uh, individuals but without any sign of them i mean they do not show the particular uh, sign on pers uh, anyone's personality but they are there unconsciously at the backdrop of your mind these primordial images or archetypes contribute to the basic stock of the unconscious psyche and cannot be called personal acquisitions so that is why there is a difference between personal unconscious and the collective unconscious as stated by uh, sigmund freud and carl jung so we move on uh, to the uh, third point uh, wherein uh, there there is i have stated that there is an uncanny similarity between 
major motifs of different civilization and there are a couple of examples now if we talk for example if we talk of water the meaning of water is similar in every every cultural setup every civilization water has a symbolic meaning it may be related to happiness flowing water it may be related to life it may be related to anything but the concept of water the understanding of a picture which contains the flow flowing water is similar to all the civilization now uh, one uh, most uh, i think i should relate it to more indian concepts indian examples so uh, one example that that reminded me of this particular like uh, a critical output by this particular uh, critic so i could relate the, the puja ki thali the, the puja thali has got uh, fragrance colors dipavali puja if you uh, everybody does it and the, the thali consists of fragrance some colors bells prasad ganga jal so actually there is there is a reason behind uh, this particular um, collection of the ingredients in that particular thali the the the, partic the reason is that it is used to excite the senses all the senses the five senses indriyo which we call them in hindi so the thali is prepared as to excite our senses while we are offering our uh, devotion to god so it has a particular meaning and it it is derived its meaning from mythological motifs so the the particular thali becomes a mythological mo motif eventually so and uh, um the oh sorry now the next point that uh, i have included in my research is uh, archetypes are archaic heritage of humanity now whatever we have received from the ancients whatever we have received from our history it's our heritage so it's it's the it's you can say it's a cultural heritage it's the heritage for humanity it's everybody's most valued it's most precious possession that we've got from our elders now the the self um, jung here speaks about four again four uh, types of uh, archaic heritage for humanity the self is physical uh, you can say totality uh, the persona is the social face that an individual presents to the world the shadow is the darker side of the person that is the low uh, self esteem anxiety false beliefs etc and the anima is the unconscious masculine side of a female and animus is the unconscious feminine side of a male so uh, these are uh, particular aspects through which uh, uh, this is the lens actually through which we look at the heritage of humanity that is the archetypal the, the archetypes the figures the motifs etc so moving on as the fifth point is self explanatory repetition engraves the image on our psyche now any kind of repetition or a reminder that happens from the past events or uh, any kind of uh, similarity between the archetypes and the current happening encourages the reminding of that particular aspect and then it becomes engraved on our psyche it becomes it just settles there forever the sixth one is archetypes have an evolutionary basis it is we, the archetypes are born somewhere as in in the om banna story the archetypes take take the birth over the, at that place and then they have an evolutionary time time and they travel through all that evolutionary time they sometimes uh, lose some of information they sometimes have some information added to them but they have an evolutionary time time through which they have traveled to us so again it's one thing it's one aspect of the archetypes being imported from the history the seventh one is archetypes contribute to individualism and individualism contributes to archetype now uh, i have put up the definition of carl jung about what is individualism it is not individuality it is different from individuality individualism it's it's uh, it's defined as bringing individuality to consciousness a particular aspect of individuality we bring it to consciousness we we use it as a peculiarity and that is individualism individuality is personality and it disintegrates or sorry it distinguishes 
uh, one person to another. You, uh, somebody may have a different individuality. I may have a different individuality. It's my personality that's, that goes into the individuality. To explain this concept, I take the example of the movie Castaway, um, in which Tom Hanks played the character of uh, Chuck Noland. And uh, uh, the, this particular character crashes on uh, No Man's Island, a deserted island. And uh, it's survival crisis over there. Now, the desire for human relationships is quite pressing over there. He, he craves for human interaction, somebody to talk to, somebody to listen to. So, uh, and uh, this desire, which, is, uh, which, is, which comes across him, is so pressing because of his archetypal influence. It's a stock evidence of archetypal influence, which we all human beings have as grown-ups. So again, this is a part of the collective unconscious wherein this desire goes and settles and comes back to us whenever we need it or whenever the times are there. So he creates, what he does is, uh, Chuck creates a surrogate company uh, by dobbing a face on a ball and he draws all, all kind of figures on that to make it appear like a human being. And uh, he creates a face and he imagines this particular ball as his companion and to the extent that he risks his life to save the ball from water. Now that imaginary companion is a response to his seclusion. Um, many people have different responses to the, their seclusion as in lot many will, uh, of us will face uh, uh, different kind of responses in this particular lockdown period but talking to themselves or uh, taking a doll as a friend or uh, maybe um, that alone barbarian kind of person talking to his animals. All these kind of things are a response to the, the lonesomeness of that person, to, to the person being lonely. Anybody who is lonely has these kind of responses towards the seclusion. And all these things give them a gust of adrenaline. And and they, their behavior is quite justified in the manner they, they create um, surrogate, surrogate responses. So now all these uh, type of uh, examples, they take us to the stage one of individualism. Though I'm not going into the deeper analysis of what individualism is, because since we are dealing with archetypes, the process of individualism is, uh, it, it dominates there is one aspect of the personality which dominates and becomes the peculiarity of that particular person. So here, Tom Hanks or Chuck's response to the seclusion becomes the peculiarity of that particular character. And uh, so forth, I move on to the next critic, Roland Barthes about myth. Now what he ha Roland Barthes has to say about myth criticism. Now, um, he says that uh, myth is a second order semiotic system. So now uh, semiotics is the study of uh, language, how does language behave, its structure and everything. So myth is a second order language system. Now imagine, again an example from my side, now imagine a military man saluting a tiranga. So um, the message through this particular picture or maybe it can exist in a movie or in, a, in an actual uh, live telecast thing. You may be there and watching the person, watching a military man saluting a teranga. Now, what is the message through this particular aspect of uh, the, the scene? So, maybe he is uh, saluting to the patriotism, Indianness. He is dedicated to duty and he is proud of his nation. So, there are, there is a language. There, this particular scene speaks volumes about the entire idea, the entire thing that is being presented over there. So, a picture, any, the second one is myth is a meta language. It uses a photograph and a book in the same way. So now, being a French theorist, Lauren Barthes wrote the book Mythologies. And in that book, he has uh, given these points about uh, the uh, mythographical usage of the mythology thing. So he says that a sign is a sign in this context refers to something that conveys a meaning, a written or a spoken word, a symbol or a myth. Now he believed that the myths drain 
popular ideas. It, it makes uh, uh, the people import popular ideas from it. And then they are repackaged to create myths which have deeper implications, deeper meanings. So now he says language implies one-sided way of seeing which selects certain characteristics as meaningful and ignores and discards the other. So language is, is a medium of deliverance of that particular idea. So language selects what is best and then it takes it on further. So um, he says that myths are a meta language. Now, uh, one more example with reference to the second point. If we uh, happen to see a picture of a cow with uh, all those gods in that picture, uh, a person who is a devout Hindu would say that um, we have to worship a cow. A person who is more analytical or uh, more critical would um, zoom that pic and see the number of gods in it and there will be different approaches towards that pic. So myth is a meta language. It uses the photograph for the information and a book in the same way. The language of the book doesn't matter. The language of the person viewing it matters over here. So the, the third one over here is myths are not arbitrary. Myths always contain some kind of analogy which removes their arbitrariness. There is a support system for myths. They have a comparison and analogy which removes their arbitrariness and motivates them. Myths don't hide anything, they distort. Everyone might have heard about uh, the Bishnoi Samaj, again, one of the examples uh, from uh, my side, from Rajasthan. Uh, uh, this Vishnoi Samaj, uh, was protecting the trees and Maharaja of Jodhpur, Abhay Singh Ji, had ordered the removal of the trees for some or the other reason. Then uh, Amrita Devi came up uh, for the saving of all those trees and she said that if one head is gone for one tree, it's it's fine, it's it's good. And she said that Ghatega Soda nahi hai. So eventually, this is, this is a Khejarli massacre that I am talking about over here. And this particular legend or this particular event happened in uh, 1730 and 363 people lost their lives uh, saving the trees, protecting the trees and these people were from Vishnoi Samaj and this happened in 1730 but now as on date there are 1730 myths attached to it. So myths are not arbitrary, they have uh, an origin, they have, uh, they are not arbitrary again, they, they, they have a support system and Khejali massacre is motivating so many myths that are prevailing around these days. So myths is not myths are not arbitrary anyhow. Moving on to the fourth point, the myths arrest language and freeze history. We do not know about when did the myth begin or the root of the myth or the starting point of that particular myth, but the myth, myth arrests language. Myths give importance to a language in which they are delivered. Myth, myth is a symbolic narrative usually of unknown origin and at least partly traditional that ostensibly related actually actual events and that is specially associated with religious beliefs. Normally it is associated with religious beliefs and the societal belief system as well. Now here one example that I would like to um, provide is the Vrat, the Vrat, the fasting in Indian system. It, it is uh, uh, related to karma, that if you if you do fasting, if you do vrat, you improve your karma. It's a, it's a traditional thing and we've been following it for so long. Now, vrat katha is a myth. The, the katha that people narrate during the process of their puja and all, it's a myth. And it goes on and on. I mean, the mother would teach the, the daughter and it goes on and on. Language is the most important tool in that particular vrat katha. And there is no history trapped in that. So it's kind of freeing the history, but it is arresting the language. It uses the device of the language, but it frees the history, historical background of that particular Vrat Katha. And it moves on and on through generations. The next one is myths need cultural knowledge. Again, relating it to the earlier point, uh, we celebrate Karvachot, uh, Vat Savitri, and Tij in Rajasthan. All of these Vrats are for the same purpose, for the longevity of the husband. Now, we have a story for each. The motive 
or the reason for uh, these ruts is uh, same. And uh, yet, lots of cultural knowledge is required. As in, if we are talking about the Karvachot, we need to know the cultural setup of the North, which is like Karvachot is celebrated in the North India. So it needs tremendous cultural knowledge when we have to um, study the, or we have to go about the study of the details of that particular Vrat. The next one is myths are consumed. We ingest myths. Myths are consumed and people are oblivious of the construction of myths. To consume a myth means to consume signs, goals, images, and meanings. Again, I would like to uh, make it more Indian. And uh, the example that comes my way is uh, haldi or turmeric. It has been used extensively in our cultural setup and we um, the main reason of consuming haldi is it's an antiseptic, one thing. Uh, second thing, uh, if we talk religiously, it is it is used to wave off negativity. That is why it is used in a lot many pujas and people apply it on forehead in ceremonies like marriages and uh, everything. So that is the reason we use turmeric because it has been attached to the concept of removing negativity. So we consume the particular myth that has been attached to Haldi or turmeric. Now, vermilion imprints on the wall, those, those red imprints on the wall and on the floor. When the new bride enters the house, she's, uh, she's uh, uh, made to put those imprints on the wall and uh, on the floor. Now, a vermilion is red color and the red color is the color of positivity as well as wealth and fertility. So that is why, this is the reason why we are consuming the myth, but we are consuming the myth Otherwise, that this is a ritual. You have to do it. That means you just have to do it. So reasons are never satisfied, uh, specified. They are never told. But we just have to do it as a ritual. But actually, we are consuming that particular myth in it, in a hidden form. Now, one more example that I'd like to elaborate over here is pot, that mitti ka ghada, which is used in uh, ghat pujan, housewarmings, uh, dipavali, marriages, the, the symbolic form of that filled pot is fulfillment or samruddhi. And then again, the concept, the, the myth we are consuming, but we are using, we are using that pot without any reasons. We, we have to use it, that is. And nobody is telling you the reason for the usage. One more example that, uh, again, I'd like to uh, narrate over here is pan, that beetle leaf. Uh, in earlier days, Whosoever belonged to the Grihas ashram, uh, they used to eat pan after their dinner or lunch. And that was symbolic of their satisfaction as well as their success and relaxation in the Grihas ashram. So we, we, do, we consume pan, but we do not know the, the, the origin, the you can say the reason behind the consumption of pan. Though pan has good health benefits as well. But then the reason that it is associated with satisfaction and relaxation was not known. But we are consuming the myth. We are, again, devouring it. Myths are consumed by uh, so many cultures and generations. And, but normally people do not know the reason why we are consuming the myth. The next one is the concept is eternal and absolute. The concept is eternal. It's, it's undeniable. Myth or tales are the continuum of human existence and collective memory. 400 years of science and technological advancement have not challenged this zone. And it has rather prompted the wisdom and human creativity irrespective of its existence in oral or the written form. It makes man connected to his past without the knowledge and consciousness. Immersing in human values and standardization of a social norm to develop a cultural industry is the biggest contribution of a myth. So when we talk about the myth being eternal and absolute, that is the last point, one example of mythical motif is more suitable here. Um, since vermilion is a symbol of a kind sobhagya that women put in their on their heads when they are after the after their marriages, uh, once Hanuman put vermilion all over his body and um, Lord Rama asked him that why have you done this so he says that 
Mata Sita is a goddess. So for the longevity of Sri Ram, one pinch is sufficient. But since I am a devotee of yours, I would have to, I, ha I would have to, uh, you can say, apply all that vermilion on my entire body for your longevity. So I have put this sindoor or vermilion on my body for your longevity, my lord. Now, this is still continuing. This myth is still continuing. As in, whenever we visit a Hanuman temple, we see the idol, which is um, it's vermilion orange in color. So that is why the concept of the myth is eternal and absolute. It is there at the backdrop. We are seeing the idol of Hanuman in orange color. And uh, so the myth and the mythical motive are, um, um, it's, it's timeless over here. It's eternal and hence it is absolute. So uh, I, I move on to the uh, next part of my presentation. Uh, these are seven techniques or figures of uh, myth uh, given by Roland Barthes. Uh, inoculation is uh, like uh, every myth admits a bit of evil into it. it it's a masala movie kind of stuff. It, it has got some kind of uh, evil or evil element as well. Myths remove history. They are its language, as in we had already discussed. Uh, it is related to the identification of self. A uh, tautology comes in when um, sometimes there's a failure of language. There's a failure of language in examining and explaining the essence of something, wherein this tautology aspect, tautological aspect comes in. Neither norism uh, comes in when the, the myths become uh, permanent and immobile. So uh, the, the quantification of the quality means that the differences are treated very well and differences are in a degree, the manner and time of deliverance matters a lot. Now, statement of facts without explanation that we end up saying this is the way it is. And uh, towards the next critic, not to cry about myth criticism in his essay, Archetypes of Literature. Now, archetypes are recurring symbols contributing to the wholeness of a literary genre. Not to cry relates the, the uh, myths to literature in a beautiful manner where he says that uh, he defined archetypes as symbol, usually an image, which occurs often in literature to be recognizable as an element of one's literary experience as a whole. So myths are tidbits that join in to form a whole in literary genre, in, liter in literature as well. No story perfectly matches the archetype because the archetype is the tidbit. Is the, these are the parts. So they cannot uh, contribute to the whole. So uh, some stories are more different and divergent from their archetypes than others. Pathos can be brought by any, any event. Pathos may be borrowed from uh, archetypes. It can be brought about by any event. In Hamlet, there is hamartia and the tragic flow of procrastination. So uh, we can relate uh, the concept of hamartia coined by Aristotle to um, Hamlet. Hubri means when the protagonist disregards uh, the divine warning. In All My Sons, uh, there is capitalist greed, abandonment of moral responsibility, calamity and sins of father visiting upon the sons. So hubri is again, hubri is a partial idea that has been taken from the myth. Um, the focus is insightful variation from the traditional archetypes and analyzing. An examination of the text simply points out how the narrative meets the criteria for spe specific archetypes. Uh, the textual analysis of different texts uh, gives us, since the archetypes provide an insightful trait that are present in different types of writing. They are useful in explanation of the text and appealing to the reader's mind. We can use the archetypes as guide. This could easily be applied to plots, characters, symbols, and settings. So I have, I have made a table explaining all the uh, genres with respect to the seasons and again, the feelings. So I move on with my presentation. Again, this I, I found uh, this figure uh, during one of my researches, uh, which says the comic movement goes up, taking the comedy and romance together, and the tragic movement goes down, taking the irony, satire, and tragedy uh, for the seasons, winter and autumn. Now, uh, moving on to the next, to the second part of my presentation, that is, I have tried to relate existentialism here with myth 
criticism. Existentialism has seized on one aspect of literary myth and raised it to an absolute. In these literary myths, the individual challenges his authoritative commonality and exercises freedom in making his personal choice. In this process of loosening the mythical hero, the, the loosening the in this process of loosening the mythical hero experiences alienation, fear, and guilt. So, uh, Sartre, uh, as I have put the name of the of the text from where I have borrowed this particular quote, I quote, uh, Sartre says, I quote, mythic is a whole situation that develops itself and not formulae which can be used to construct an anecdote inside the society, inside a story, unquote. He says that man is a phenomena related to history. So when he is related to history, he brings in all kind of myths with him. And this is the con this is wherein he relates existentialism with myth criticism. And these are a couple of examples that I have uh, taken for the research purpose. And um, I move on to the next part of my uh, presentation that is Marxism and myth or archetypal criticism. Now, Marxist talk of utopia. Marxist literary criticism is a loose term describing literary criticism based on socialists and dialectic theories. According to Marxists, even literature itself is a social institution and has a specific ideological function based on the background and ideology of the author. So um, this is one thesis that, uh, that uh, towards individuated socialism, I came across uh, my research. And on the in the chapter three and on page 19, uh, Stephen elaborates a critique of Prude Marx synthesis that has been attempted by various Marxist scholars. And he goes on to develop a relationship between Jung's concept of psyche and the areas of confluence which exist between Marxism and depth psychology. So these are a couple of examples. And uh, um, in, in one of the books, again, by uh, the Namely Philosophy and Myth, third edition by Robert C. Tucker, uh, he says that, I quote, Marx is a moralist, but does not fit in the description of moral philosopher. He is concerned about all with an issue of good and evil, unquote. So the, the issue of good and evil comes in again uh, in harmony with the idea of uh, utopias and dystopias. So we can relate Marxism and archetypal criticism as well. These are a couple of examples uh, on the slide already. So uh, moving on to the next part of my presentation, psychoanalytic criticism and myth archetypal criticism. So now um, Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung were the main propounders of this theory. So Freud and Jung initially developed their theories together. However, they had differences, and as a result, it was two schools of thought. So uh, Freud play, uh, pays close attention to human behavior and repressed emotions, uh, that personal unconscious thing. Jung believed that human psyche was more multifaceted, and his study was more extensive with that respect as well. Like Karl Marx, Jung believed that the religion was the opiate of the masses, and it should not be propagated. Now, um, for the convenience uh, of um, the professors to uh, understand this concept more, I have taken the example of the life of Pi by Yen Martel. The character, the study in the life of Pi states that it is the, the, it's the study of the journey of the character looking for God. Now, the process of maturity, the working of the id, Ego and superego in different situations. It's all there in the book. Archetypes contribute to the unconscious, again, of the character. The character's name is Prisain Molita Patel um, in the movie Life of Pi. Based on, it's, a, it's, a free, it's based, the character is based on the freedom psycho, psychoanalytic theory. His organization of personality in his id, he has good and the bad temper. In his ego, he has ambition to follow three religions because he, is, he loves God. And for his superego, he has an ambition. He knows. The superego tells him that if he is he's ambitious, he'll be criticized by other people and the people will quarrel. So all the three elements perfectly, um, they, they can be used for the analysis of this particular text. In his dynamics of personality, he has eros, uh, thanatos, 
instincts and three anxieties. The three anxieties, namely uh, reality anxiety, neurotic anxiety, and moral anxiety. Now, uh, Richard Parker, the 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 character, the tiger in the book, uh, represents the shadow archetype. The shadow we we have talked uh, about uh, a couple of minutes back. The darker side, the, the darker uh, aspects of human personality. French cook is the hyena. The great mother, orange juice, represents the orangutan. So, do many of the ideas have been borrowed from the myths? Let us move on to the next slide. Uh, symbolism and archetypal criticism. As already stated, that uh, the, sim the archetypal motifs or the mythical motifs, everything contributes as a symbol. So, symbolism and archetypal criticism. Indian archetypes, legendary, um, I can name a few, and I am sure you might be knowing a lot many archetypes, Indian archetypes. So, uh, my examples that I would want to offer over here are Mantara, symbolic of that cunningness aspect, uh, Taj Mahal, Savitri, Supankha, and the list is endless. It goes on and on. Uh, the next one is the archetypes, uh, the symbols that are used uh, regarding feelings and situational uh, approaches. So a uh, picture of a desert maybe. So that is a feeling and situational thing and becomes the, the desert becomes a symbol for certain kind of feelings. And it speaks volume about the forlornness or the lack of hope. Uh, Dushant and Shakuntala image speaking of feeling of romance. Then Eve is symbolic uh, for the fall of man. Uh, in the same way, Sita is symbolic for end of Lanka. The Helen of Troy is symbolic for the end of Troy. So there are many feelings, there are many pictures which are related, symbols related to feelings and they are situational as well. Now, lover symbolic of a tragic end. When we when we take the name of Heer Ranja, Romeo Juliet, etc., we have an image that, we have an idea in the brain that they will never meet in the end. So the, the story is going to be going to have a, it, it is going to have a tragic end ultimately. So many colors that symbolize different aspects of human life. Red for romance, violence. One diversion that I found with the white color, though the white color is associated with marriage in Christianity and death in Hinduism. One um, diversion from this regular image of marriage and death comes to me: the white the white color. Uh, Miss Havisham in Charles Dickens uh, withers in white dress. And why does she wither? Because her clothes become a protest against the shattering of her great expectations. So this is a kind of a deviation from the regular right, white image of happy marriage. And Eugene O'Neill's uh, long day's journey into the night. The wedding dress claims the loss of happiness of a lonely married woman. This is again a diversion from the regular idea of white being the color of marriage and death. So let's go on to some mythical structures related to feminism. Now herein, I am taking the archetypes to the next level where I'm not relating any kind of, um, you can say, image or any kind of symbol to feminism. I'm relating the concept, the structure, the happenings from mythology being incorporated into feminism. Now rape trauma archetypes, um, the rape of... Um, Philomela, that, that I stated earlier, Apollo and Daphne, and in our own Indian literature, Kamla Das has a lot of rape trauma archetype in her uh, writings. The patriarchy ruling the society archetypes in lot many lot many uh, books. Uh, I can name a few over here. Shashi Deshpande, Anita Desai, Savitri Bhai Phule, Amrita Pritam, Kamla Das, Mahashweta Devi, Kamla Markande, Krishna Sopti, Chitra Banerji, Baby Kamble, uh, Meena Kandaswamy, Bharti Mukherjee, Urmila Pawar, and the list goes on and on. So uh, the next one is poverty archetype, or poverty ar archetype, of course, in Dalit women literature. The quest for identity archetype, um, Alice Walker's The Color Purple, Zora Neale Hurston's The Rise of Watching God, um, Gloria Naylor's The Women of Brewster Place, and of course, the list is endless. Again, uh, these were a couple of examples from my side. The lack of education archetype, in Simone de Beauvoir's Room of One Zone, who else? So, I mean, and the list goes, on, list goes on again. Disturbed marriage and child marriage, remarriage, widowhood archetype in Shashi Deshpande, Sudha Murthy, and lot many writers. Hymen or the virginity archetype in Muslim women literature, not to forget 
the uh, the princess trilogy by jean sassoon sita savitri archetype women are made to sacrifice the mother figure archetype chitra banerji not to forget bharti mukherjee's wife uh, and there might be lots of examples to go with it and uh, my learned friends might be knowing now the ideal female body archetype none other than young adult literature and so to say in victorian times as well wherein in all, mostly uh, most of the dramas have that corset thing which women used to um, adorn to show that hourglass figure thing but then eventually their dress made them look uh, bulky uh, okay fine but then the ideal female body archetype exists in literature to an tremendous extent now slavery archetype african american women literature the best suited example is toni morrison's beloved over here and lot many my learned friends might be knowing so uh, feminism can be appropriately related to mythic structures and lot many archetypes in the form of mythic structure are observed through a lens of feminism archetypes and children literature as this colorful slide shows that there are many archetypes of farm fatal who can forget the farm fatal in um, our ancient tales fairy tales wherein the tragedy is always brought about by a female who is like bone of contention who is who is holding the entire tragedy on her shoulders the entire drama on her shoulders is farm fatal the ugly sisters prince charming from cinderella serpent snow white etc hero superman batman spider man villain satan and the endless list rapunzel bheem and so many archetypes from our literature some of the examples that come from my side are uh, harry potter series they exploit a lot of archetypes cs lewis narnia chronicle uh, lord of the rings chacha choudhary panchatantra uses a lot of archetypes and builds up lot of archetypes as well akbar birbal tenali rama cinderella etc etc so friends i end up with my presentation over here and not to forget the most important archetype from ancient literature is phoenix bird and who other than literature people know the importance of the phoenix bird and which contributes which is an example for our, our ancient wisdom thank you for your patient listening and i'd like to welcome all your questions now yes over to you prashant sir yes sir and um, there are certain questions in q and a certainly just click click on q and a oh just Take a moment questions. sir okay sir okay so i got them yes um can we consider anti hero as an archetypal character yes in one of my uh, slides i gave the example of satan so uh, since satan was an anti hero and we can use him as an archetypal character we already do so many traits from satan's personality have been incorporated with the anti hero concept so we can definitely use and i think uh, i satisfied uh, that's a query of yours yes uh, yes uh, i i read the question from mitali the tradition of women after marriage wearing mangal sutra and sindoor is considered as married what about the men okay so now you are <laughs> taking me to the zone of feminism feminism and yes, yes. <laughs> uh, the thing is that uh, we are yet to decide about what men will wear so i think in times to come men will wear the mangal sutra as well <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next one is uh, the the name is not there uh, how repetition engraves the images on our psyche please elaborate okay now repetition engraves the images on our psyche say for instance um you have read a book by um baby haldar or baby kamble she talks about the abuse the rape that has happened to her in her life baby haldar uh, last night I, i just finished the book by her um there was a book about uh, there's an instance in the book about the rape imagine uh, i i i read about that rape in that particular uh, context and suddenly i took it to the dragging of uh, uh, dropadi into the court and the way she was handled there and then can i relate those 
images while reading a book and imagining about Draupadi's Vastraharan. I can definitely do that. Why? Because both are violence against women. So images compile and create the idea. The earlier image is imposed, is rather superimposed by the current image and then that affects the psyche. So a kind of repetition has happened with respect to the idea that the rape happened there also, sorry, the abuse happened there also, the abuse happened here also. So I can relate and involve my psyche into thinking about the violence that was occurred to both the females. So the images of the, the Draupadi Vastraharan and the image of this particular uh, rape that has been created by baby Haldar or baby Kamble in her book, they, they coincide with each other and affects the psyche. And then ultimately there's a revision that happens about the archetypes. So that is why I think I am I'm able to justify and I'm able to explain the context and um, the, the examples relevantly well. Now, how the, the next question is from uh, Ashok Kadam, sir. And uh, since, oh, sorry, I'm not, since the attendees are all from the all sections of society, it would have been better if you included examples of myths from different cultures. So, sir, actually, uh, my knowledge to all the myths is limited. And next time when I present the same thing, I'll incorporate all the myths from South India and East India as well. As for now, I'm just using the North India and West India. So thank you for your suggestions. I'll definitely uh, look for more, I'll do more research on this particular thing. And uh, the, the next question is by Sangeeta ma'am. Uh, COVID-19 would become an archetype in literature after 2050. What's your take on it? Oh, we all hope it does not. <laughs> we don't want to get into the archetypal mode because otherwise then the images will come back, the thing will come back, it will bounce back. So, so let's hope for the best that the COVID-19 thing doesn't become an archetype. Though it will be a story in the, maybe when we go to 2050 and uh, there'll be a story related to COVID-19. Let's see what happens. There, there'll be some events, some stories connected to it, definitely. And we'll have material to write on. Let's see, but we hope it doesn't eventually. Now, the next question is from Sunita Bajaj, ma'am. Do myths evolve or interpreted differently? They have a, 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 an origin place, like in that Om, Om Banna story I told you, that uh, the, myth, the myth originated from the accident of Om Banna. And then they, were, they had an evolution, they had an, a time where they spread and they were differently narrated, they were, they were carried on, and the language changes, the, the context changes sometimes, some, in, some information is also lost. So uh, myths evolve and they are interpreted differently as well because dichotomies was one word that I used in one of my slides that dichotomies happen and there are different point of views as well. So uh, I am thankful for all the questions and I think, I hope I have answered. No, I have one more question uh, from Mr. Suryakant. How can we apply Jungian criticism to Dalit studies? So now, uh, are we talking about uh, Dalit women's studies, right? So uh, with that perspective, we can analyze today collective unconsciousness. When Jung says about collective, speaks about collective unconsciousness, we can use the lens of collective unconsciousness and we can analyze the characters from the particular story. And then now he's asked, uh, just a moment, sorry, am I answering? Yes, yes. Where, where's the question gone? I mean, it's, it's disappeared already. Okay, so we can use the uh, particular lens uh, from Jungian criticism, that is the collective unconscious thing, and we can apply to the study of the characters belonging to the Dalit studies, the, the Dalit feminism or the Dalit women, because, okay, see, for instance, the way I am talking to uh, to you the way I'm presenting myself, the way Mr. Prashant is presenting himself. It's the collective unconsciousness that is contributing to this kind of personality that has been made. So Mr. Prashant is the result of the collective unconsciousness that has been accumulated for so for so long, for all his years, uh, for all his age, for all his life. So we can use this particular lens definitely 
to examine the Dalit literature as well. Yes. Um, uh, okay, fine, uh, Prashant ji. I have lot many questions to answer still. Uh, so, Mr. Harry, Harry's question is: uh, Do you think the character of Supanka in the Ramayan is type of archetype? A woman wanting a married man? Yes, it is certainly. Lot many books have projected a woman uh, who goes in for a married man. And um, as for now, uh, I I don't remember the examples. Otherwise, I would have explained. It is an archetype, definitely. One thing, and for the second thing, that she got her nose cut uh, by Lakshman, and so the result also becomes an archetype. You you, you do one thing like uh, what she did. to face the result so the entire idea of a woman approaching a married man becomes the archetype also it has appeared in lot many books and it has reappeared reappeared so many times and it is definitely an archetype so uh, going on to the next question uh, is indian religious history is a myth like ramayana and mahabharat indian religious history is post ramayana and mahabharat we kind of relate our religious history to ramayan and mahabharat only what else but then there are books because our indian history religion is most projected most explained very well uh, explained in the vedas as well so it is not confined to uh, ramayan and mahabharat uh, not to these two stories itself but otherwise also our vedas project our indian religious history quite well and i hope i have answered your question um going on to mr harry a no no in our indian culture therefore needs to be punished i'm sorry i am not able to uh, yes yes, yes. the, the question is not question. Yeah. yes okay the next question is uh, no i don't think i have more questions do i have yeah yes yes there is one more by lena how can uh, oh. lena ma'am okay how can i apply archetypal criticism to a exotic novel now this is about the hero so uh, uh, it's about the hero worship thing it's about the historical incorporation with the heroic aspects so you can definitely apply archetypal criticism because archetypes talk about heroes hero uh, worship talks about the the characters of a hero in an in a legendary context we can we can find lot many uh, myths about the hero even ram was a hero okay so archetypal criticism can be used to exotic novels as well and there may be lot many examples where in uh, even in carl jung he speaks about the hero worship aspect as well which i did not incorporate in one of my in any of my research but i had read about it that carl jung speaks about the hero aspect of human personality which dominates our psyche and it again becomes our individualism so going on further with this you can definitely apply and can be a very good topic for research as well so uh, the next one is um i am not able to read the question i think we are ma'am no uh, there is one more question oh, uh, from okay. tina uh, ma'am why had sita sacrifice not been respected by people um well it was respected definitely and i think uh, all of us on this platform do respect sita's sacrifice and uh, the dignity with which she made the sacrifice so Uh, i think it is respected always has been respected since ages and the next question by mr harry do you think the character okay we 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 have uh, i have answer to this um, do i have any more questions prashant ji no no okay okay yeah, so this that. is it okay, okay. this thank is you. it yes okay uh, thank, thank you to all the participants and thank you for your patient listening yes ma'am thank you prashant ji i really thank appreciate you. yes thank you very much uh, dr vibhav ji for your fruitful highly informative thought provoking and insightful session with your spontaneous language you clearly examined critical perspectives on myth uh, theory features of myth figures of myth ronald barthes about myth northern fry about myth criticism psychological criticism and myth criticism symbolism and myth criticism mythical structures and feminism myth and children literature and in short correlating myth criticism with the selected critical theories thank you very much one and all for your active participation by logging zoom app regularly and those who are watching on youtube channel and made this lecture series a grand success langlet lecture series believe in the philosophy 
let's learn from each other so stay at home stay safe and enjoy language feast daily thank you very much ma'am thank you sir thank you